We're continuing our series in the book of Acts, which we've called um, uh, the Acts of Jesus through his apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit. So um, uh, Acts is the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, um, and uh, Luke is the account of Jesus' earthly ministry, and then um, Acts is the, the continuation of that as Jesus ascends into heaven. And just have a look um, on your sheets under the passage I'm about to read, um, under the line here, Acts 1, the key verse, really, of the book of Acts. Jesus says to his disciples, um, who've seen him die and rise, have been reassured of their forgiveness in him, um, have a massive heart to pray, uh, their prayer life uh, would put us to shame. And yet he says to them, wait, and then he says, verse 8, Acts 1, there on your sheets, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And as we've been seeing, um, although they were capital A apostles, capital W witnesses, um, we are small a apostles, which just means those who are sent by the Lord Jesus, small W witnesses, uh, by that same Holy Spirit, although we didn't see Jesus physically die and rise, through the apostles' account in the scriptures, we can be witnesses. But we can only be that if we too are empowered by the Spirit. And so um, with that in mind, we've been looking again and again as we've been working our way through Acts so far to think, is what they experienced back then something we can expect and pray into today? And my feeling more and more as I've been looking into that, this is yes, as long as we recognize our utter weakness, our total dependence, and that it's only by the power of the Spirit of God that we will be able to be Jesus' witnesses. And, and here we come to a passage um, where as things are progressing, we've seen a few kind of um, stops and starts on the way. Um, there's been the threat of persecution um, and we saw that really come to a head last week. We're going to see a little bit of that as we, as we start this passage. We saw the threat of hypocrisy in the church, people trying to fake it to make it, uh, trying to um, show that they could um, look good on the outside, and the Holy Spirit revealed their hearts and rooted that out of the church. So we've seen the threat of persecution, the threat of hypocrisy. Now we get to see the threat of distraction, distraction from that core ministry. And so I'm going to read um, just straight through uh, the passage at the top of your sheets from the end of Acts 5 through to verse 7 of Acts chapter 6. Um, and then I'll work through it more slowly. Um, I'd love you to feel free that you can interrupt at any point, ask questions, clarify. If I say something you don't um, understand, um, there'll also be a time at the end uh, for more discussion and questions. That's the plan anyway. Um, so let's get going. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to pray. I know Kat's already prayed, but I'm just going to pray that verse in Psalm 25. Verse 4. Show me, show us your ways, Lord. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us, for you are God, our Saviour, and our hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of our youth and our rebellious ways. According to your love, remember us. Lord, we thank you so much that we can come to you and ask you to answer our prayers, not because of what we've done. Uh, we know that would cut us off from you. Uh, but because of your steadfast love, your covenant love displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Show us, reveal yourself to us as we look at your word now. And show us your ways, show us a clear path before us. Give us that sense of knowing where the footsteps of the Holy Spirit are treading before us so that we can walk and keep in step with him. Amen. Okay, Acts 5, 41, the end of Acts chapter 5. Just as a reminder of what we were looking at last week, the apostles, that's the, the whole 12, left the Sanhedrin, that's the court, the Jewish court, where they were threatening them with... Um, well, they beat them, but they were threatening them with death if they didn't shut up about Jesus, but they refused to shut up about Jesus. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 
it's striking, we were talking about this um, uh, earlier this week, the, the idea of the name is the name of the Lord in the Old Testament, the name of Yahweh. Um, and so if anyone ever tells you that um, the early books of the Bible don't really refer to Jesus as God, <laughs> we are. Um, there's only one person who would be described as the name, and that would be the name of God. This is, this is saying that they know Jesus is God. Um, they've been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ. So despite all that persecution, they go out, filled with the Spirit, empowered to proclaim day after day that Jesus is the Messiah. That's our model. And then, Acts 6, in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. Let me just pause there. Um, Hellenistic, uh, that means Greek. Um, it, it's another word for Greek. Um, so the Greek Jews complained against the Hebraic Jews. That's the, 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 those who spoke Hebrew. So the Greek-speaking Jews uh, complained against the Hebrew-speaking or the Aramaic-speaking Jews. Um, this is a kind of uh, racial thing. Um, hundreds of years before, uh, God's people had been um, uh, defeated by their enemies, uh, first of Assyria and then of Babylonia, and scattered across uh, the world. And then after that, the Greeks came in under Alexander the Great, and um, uh, everyone was forced to speak Greek. And so it's a bit like the sort of rise of the British Empire led to English becoming the main language of the world. Well, back then, even more so, Greek was the main language of the world. And if you were spread across, um, if you were in, sort of exiled and you'd never come back to Jerusalem, then you were a Hellenistic Jew. You, you, Greek was probably your first language. You might have, um, well, you would have heard Hebrew in the synagogue, um, but there would have been a, a sort of a beginning of a racial, certainly a cultural diversity. And as those uh, Greek-speaking Jews came in for the special festivals, uh, many of them were converted as they heard the good news of the Lord Jesus. And the church was growing and growing to uh, over 10,000 now. And um, there was this division in the church. As their cultural diversity increased, uh, you got this division between those who were on the inside. They were the, the proper uh, born in Jerusalem, born in Israel, um, Hebrew-speaking, Aramaic-speaking Jews, as against the those outcasts, those Greek-speaking Jews. Um, and so there was a tension there, and in that tension, well, let's look again, the Hellenistic Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews who'd come in, complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, there were probably even more widows among the Greek-speaking Jews than the, than the Hebrew-speaking Jews because at the time... Um, Often what was a cultural norm is for the, the Greek-speaking Jews who'd sort of lived all their life outside the land to think, I want to go and retire and die in the land. And so they would come, and as is normally the case, uh, the husband would die before the wife. And so you'd end up with a lot of widows, uh, Greek-speaking widows, in the land, dying. Many of those had been converted, come to Christ, were part of the church. Um, but because of this cultural barrier... They were being overlooked, and it wasn't good. Uh, they were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We'll come back to that. So the twelve, the apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and also Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, so there's uh, the reading. Um, we're going to go back over that in detail. Um, this is the title that I've given to this week's uh, passage. Who are the ministers of the church? And we're going to see that word minister um, is very significant in this passage, although annoyingly um, we don't get to see 
um, how in the Greek, but we'll get to see that in a moment. This is what we... Uh, well, I typed into Google, ministers of the church, and all of the Google images were like this. Um, this is what the world thinks of, this is what Google thinks of when it thinks of ministers of the church. Um, and I can't think of a more unhelpful image for ministers of the church, and hopefully you'll agree by the time we get to at the end of the passage. Um, who are the ministers of the church? Well, let's see as we work through this passage and the first point on your sheets um, is there the threat the threat to the church so threat of persecution then of hypocrisy here now the threat of distraction now it starts in those days um, it's easy to read this first time and think this all happened this seven verses all happened in a day um, no in those days so what we're getting is a summary from Luke in seven verses of what might have happened over months and months. And gradually it became clearer that this tension was building and they needed to do something about it. In those days, um, when the number of disciples was increasing, so really encouraging church growth here um, to, as I said, over 10,000 people. We don't know exactly how many. Um, some estimate many more than that. Um, and... Uh, Within this, this massively growing church, um, a complaint, a grumble arises. Um, the, the word in, in the original language is um, onomatopoeic, like the English word murmuring. Um, it's, it's a word that is writing down what it sounds like. And um, so the, the idea is that there was this sort of grumbling going on in the church. And they were grumbling, specifically, we're told, about food. Well, that's what it seems to be that they're grumbling about. And for those early Christians who had their Jewish scriptures very much at the forefront of their mind, they would have been desperately worried about this. Because when God's people had um, been through the, the, the shadow of the things that happened in Jesus, so when they'd been slaves in Egypt rather than uh, which is a picture of slavery to sin, and they'd been rescued from slavery in Egypt and taken through the Red Sea, like uh, Jesus going through death and rising again, and they'd ended up in the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land, the first thing that started to happen among God's people then is that they started murmuring, or grumbling, or complaining, and specifically they were complaining about food. And so the, um, the, the, the Twelve are, are desperately worried and they, they gather together. But what's really striking is they don't blame those who are complaining. Um, I was helped recently um, uh, when I was talking about struggles and issues that we were facing in the church. And um, I talked to someone. He said, well, you know when you go to, uh, when you watch um, that TV, those TV programs like Super Nanny? Has anyone ever seen those? Look at that, there's some real positive murmuring about Super Nanny. Um, Super Nanny is when, when this, this woman who knows how to uh, bring up kids well, can you turn me down a tiny bit? I just seem to be buzzing. Um, woman who knows um, how to bring up kids well goes into a family that's really struggling. And the first thing you always see in, in those episodes is you see the kids running absolutely wild. And you look at these children sort of pulling each other's hair and shouting at their parents and being utterly rude. And you think, those children just need to be controlled. Let's sort out those kids. And you think the super nanny is going to go to them and go, you need to get yourselves in order, kids. But she doesn't. She stops. And then she sits down with the parents. And she says, look, you're the dominant culture here. <laughs> You've brought the kids into this setting. You need to think about how you set the tone, how you create the environment in which these kids know how to be. And he said, although the parallels aren't identical, actually the idea of a dominant culture in a church, when there's another culture coming in or new cultures coming in, as we pray that that would be the case in this church as the diversity increases, as the gospel goes out to reflect the diversity of Streatham, the dominant culture doesn't need to go to those who are finding it hard and go, well, you just need to fall in line. Instead, the dominant culture needs to think, how can we take action positively to include the minority culture? 
And the apostles know that the solution is to dedicate time to provide for this genuine need that they recognize. They don't deny the need. They don't try and brush it under the carpet. They recognize it. They know they need to dedicate time to provide for this genuine need. But that's where the threat comes. The real threat was to the priority of the word. So secondly, on your sheets. Ooh. Actually, let me um, just, I, I realize why I put these on. Um, first, the, uh, they're empowered by the Spirit to be Jesus' witnesses, which, which is why the church is growing. I mean, it's just massively encouraging, but with growth comes problems of diversity as people are saved. So as this church is empowered by the Spirit to witness, problems come in. That's what we should expect. If we're going to pray to be empowered by the Spirit to be Jesus' witnesses to all kinds of people, which is one of our vision statements, then we're going to expect growth and we're going to expect issues. People are going to come in and complain about things that we weren't even aware of. Um, and it's in especially the case as we try and do this part of our vision statement, reaching unreached nations from Streatham. The Lord has brought the nations to Streatham. Um, and so we pray for this kind of problem, actually. We pray for this kind of problem. But as, uh, as the church leaders try and dedicate time to the problems that will arise, well, then the threat then highlights the priority. And that's what we get to see. We're going to spend a bit more time in this uh, from verse 2. Just have a look at verse 2. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Now you'll see on your sheets um, that I've put in italics uh, the few words at the end of uh, verse 1, uh, at the end of verse 2, and at the end of verse 4. The reason I've put those in italics, distribution of food and wait on and ministry, is those are all the same word. Um, and so uh, in verse 1, it says that their widows were being overlooked in the daily, and it's not actually distribution of food, it's just the daily ministry. The daily ministry. And then again, it says it would not be right for us to neglect. Interestingly, in the original, it says not be right for us to neglect the word of God in order to minister on tables. And then, um, verse 4, we will give ourselves, give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word, that is the word ministry. It's all the same word. So there's different kinds of ministry being highlighted here. So it's not that um, uh, the ministers are the people up at the front, the employed people, like the, that image of um, that church setting with all those people in robes. The ministers are not the important people at the front. Um, actually, what we discover is that all of us are ministers. And the word for minister is the same word, is the Greek word for servant. For servant. And so I've put on your sheets Luke uh, chapter 22, um, the third extra paragraph down. Um, just before Jesus went to the cross, we're told, Luke 22 verse 24, a dispute arose among them, that's the, the, the disciples who were with him, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles of the nations <laughs> lord it over them, they control them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves, give themselves this grand title of benefactors, <coughs> being like sort of aristocrats over their, uh, their controlled people. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should become like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? It's not the one, like in the world, who is at the table, the one who's, who's receiving, who's being served. But the greater one is like Christ. I am the one. I am among you as one who serves, Jesus says, as one who serves. It's the same word, diakonos, minister, serve. That's where we get our, our English word minister. And so when, when we ask the question, who are the ministers of Streatham Central Church, what do we all say? Correct. Um, we're all servants. We're all servants. And, and it's striking that we're not, um, we're going to think about this a little bit um, later, but we're not described ever as volunteers. I often think, oh, it's really hard leading a charity of volunteers. Well, if we were just a charity of volunteers, then that would be hard. But actually, what we've got is a church, is a gathering God's people around his word under the Lord Jesus Christ of servants. And the priority of 
those gathered servants around the Lord Jesus Christ is the priority of the word. Because if we forget the priority of the word, then the church can't grow or reach out. Now, there are many people inside the wider church and outside who want us to do the serving without the words. The problem is that you actually kill the church if you ask them to do the serving without the words. One of our vision statements is, is this, motivated by the gospel to care for those in need. As part of being shameless in mission, we, we do want to care for the needy. But if we miss that first half of the sentence, motivated by the gospel, then we'll start kind of very enthusiastically, aren't we good caring for the needy? And then we'll kind of forget why we're doing it, and then it's just a lot easier to settle back into our own comfort. You see, actually, without the priority of the word, of the gospel, then actually less needs get cared for. You see, if you prioritise unity around things like looking after people, a lot, a lot of uh, talk across the churches is that we need to prioritise unity. The problem is you get things like groups like Churches Together, and if you examine those groups across the country, a lot of them, not all of them, wonderfully, there's some wonderful exceptions, when they prioritise unity, they just, you just have an empty shell of leaders meeting together to pat each other on the back that we're all saying the same thing. But you prioritise the gospel and those who love the Lord Jesus get excited and want to work hard to unite around the gospel and get the gospel out. So actually you prioritise the word, you get more unity, you get more service. You prioritise the unity and the service and you lose everything. And so this is what's under threat here. They know they need to care for those in need, but what if that distracts them from being able to do the ministry of the word? Well, actually, their role in ensuring that the church works well together means teaching the church to all be able to speak the truth. So although there's different areas of ministry described here, both totally legitimate, one caring for uh, organising and administering needs, and one preaching, actually the preaching permeates into every aspect of church life. Just, just have a look at Ephesians 4 on your sheets. There at the bottom. It says, Ephesians 4.11, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service, in italics, same word, works of ministry, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let me just pause there. Um, so the role of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers is in that teaching role is to equip all of God's people to be the ministers for the works of ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. So, okay, so the teaching role is there to equip and then we all get on with our little tasks. Yes, but let's keep reading. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. So if we're not taught in the church, we're going to be taught by others. We're always being taught. In the, in the TV programs we watch, in the news we watch, in the adverts that we watch, in the things that we listen to, in the people that we meet with, we're always being taught. So if we're not taught the word of God, we're going to be taught by something else. You, you're never a vacuum. So then if we're taught by the church, then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning, of craft, cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, all of us, verse 15, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him, the whole body joined together and held together by every supporting lig ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So you do notice every little bit of the body, whatever ministry they're doing, whether it looks practical or it looks up front, is actually speaking the truth in love. Everyone's being trained to be speakers of the truth in love. That's the, the role of the pastor teachers is to equip everybody to be speaking the truth in love. And this is actually 
also one of our vision statements under being shameless in community. We are an intimate family, an interdependent body, speaking the truth in love. Uh, and often people take this verse out of context and think speaking the truth in love means saying something really hard with a smile on your face. <laughs> and and it, it could mean that. It could mean that. But no, it's mainly, it's capital T truth. Speaking the truth as in the truth of God's word into each other's lives. And sometimes that's a word of encouragement. Uh, sometimes that's just a reminder of, of something you've read that morning or that you've been praying about. Um, it's speaking the capital T truth of God's word into each other's lives to build each other up to maturity. So that the more we need each other, the less we need each other because we're being more equipped. But actually, we always need each other to be speaking into each other's lives. But it's not the idea that there's one person who knows the word of God up at the front and they download to everyone else and everyone else then gets on with doing their practical tasks. No, we're all learning to be speakers. Which is why we pray at the beginning of every meeting that we get together. These, these verses from either Ephesians 5 or Colossians 3.16, that we'd be filled with the Spirit to be speaking to one another with the Word of God, with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Or in Colossians 3, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So we're all learning to be ministers in different ways with our different gifts, but always rooted in the Word of God. That's the priority and if we miss that, then everything falls apart. That's what the threat was to this church. And what we also see is that this means that the apostles must also lead the church in prayer because of this massive threat. Do you see verse uh, 4? The apostles say, we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. That recognition that we can't just open the Bible and think we know it all, we need to come humbly and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word, by his spirit, and then to equip us to face all the different battles that we'll face. And, and those apostles need to lead the church in, in gathered prayer. Most of the prayer we see in the early chapters of Acts are mostly gathered prayer. And so we need to be modelling, gathering for prayer, and then gathering more and more people for prayer. We need that priority of prayer and the ministry of the word. And so one of our vision statements under being shameless in worship is shamelessly prayerful, that we would become that. And, and it's encouraging that 2019 has been uh, a year that we've got a year of prayerfulness. And it was really encouraging last week, wasn't it, hearing Richard just say, it's been lovely to see you guys building patterns of prayer into the church. But we're nowhere near like these guys. And so... I'm thinking that when we gather together as, as um, elders to kind of review the year and look ahead to 2020, we should just call it the year of greater prayerfulness. <laughs> TBC. Um, let's look on to um, point three uh, on your sheets, the solution. Just have a look at verse three. So the threat and now the solution. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then that description describes these other guys, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So this is the solution. The threat is that the apostles might be distracted from continuing to build that word ministry across the church. And so they appoint these seven leaders. And if you think about it, these seven leaders are going to be administering, looking after over 10,000 people. So these aren't doers necessarily. These are organizers. They're going to mobilize and get together because there's no way that seven people could look after the daily needs of 10,000 people. But they're going to be organizers. These are going to be leaders who are going to use their God-given gifts to administer the church and, and provide for the daily needs and so on. And so they also need to be full of the Spirit. It's striking, isn't it, that we, we often 
um, can think that as soon as we become a Christian, we're then full of the Spirit. Um, that's not uh, necessarily the case. Uh, in fact, it's not the case in the sense of a, of, a, of a finite way. If you look at the way the idea of being filled with the Spirit is used in Acts, uh, the guys at the beginning, before Pentecost, were very clearly converted. They had the Holy Spirit in them in that he, uh, had, uh, they, they were born again. They had new hearts, able to respond to the gospel. Um, so they were indwelt by the Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit living in them, but they weren't in the way that Acts talks about, full of the Spirit, until they waited and prayed, and then they received the power, empowerment of the Spirit. And what we see actually all the way through Acts, um, up until this point, is that being filled with the Spirit pretty much exclusively means empowerment for mission. And so it would be very strange if suddenly, in Acts chapter 6, the word full of the Spirit just meant godly and nice. No, it seems to be that full of the Spirit means empowered for mission. And actually that makes total sense because at least the first two guys and probably all seven, uh, Stephen and Philip, were great evangelists. They, were, um, they went out. Uh, Stephen, in a very public way, gave, gives the longest sermon in Acts and then gets killed for it um, in the next chapter. And, and Philip is then a fantastic personal evangelist. So you get different kinds. Um, maybe Stephen was the extrovert, Philip the introvert. Um, but uh, these, these uh, different kinds of guys, but they're empowered for mission as they then look after the needs of the church. So it's not that, again, it's not that the apostles are doing word ministry and these guys are just doing the practical stuff. Um, all these things are, they're, are intertwined. And actually those who organize the practical things of church need to be filled with the Spirit to have that priority. Otherwise, they end up thinking the practical things of church are more important than getting the gospel out. They need to be full of the Spirit. They also need to be full of wisdom, able to discern the issues and, and lead well. And then what's really striking is um, from their names, we know that they were all Greek names. And the last guy, we're told, um, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, that means he was born a Gentile. So he was, he was, never, he was never Jewish until he converted to Judaism, and then he came to Jerusalem, heard the gospel, and became a believer. And so although all the, the, the believers in um, Jerusalem in these days were um, Jewish in origin, um, what we get to see is there's, there's cultural diversity, and these ones are Greek Jews, and the problem that the apostles identified was that it was the Greek widows who were being overlooked. And so what they did was they appointed and laid hands on, kind of ordained, those who were visibly representing the minority, which is striking, isn't it? It means that when, as we grow in diversity as a church, as we go out with the gospel, what we need to make sure is that the leadership up front reflects the diversity of the church. It's so easy to, uh, for people like me to think, oh, well, I get people like me, and so just to keep training and appointing more people like me. And I need to be like those first apostles and look beyond those cultural differences and identify those, we need to identify those who are full of the spirit and wisdom, but not just in my kind of upper middle class English wisdom, or lack of. Well, finally we then get, um, sorry, I haven't been clicking through. That was the solution. <laughs> and now uh, we look at the result. And uh, the result is just there in verse seven. So the word of God spread. You'd, you'd expect Luke to record, so the widows were well looked after. But he doesn't. He says, so the word of God spread. You see, we need people who are gifted by the Holy Spirit to organize people and manage people so that the word of God can continue to spread. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I was reflecting on this. I mean, it's just wonderfully encouraging, isn't it? That those people who would have been in the temple really angry and, and not liking what Jesus was doing uh, in his earthly ministry are then being won over. It's striking the priests in those days uh, in, in, in the temple were there to organize the temple. 
and, and also provide for the needs of people who came to the temple and, uh, and make sure they had the sacrifices they need. They, the priests were the looker after us. And it's interesting that as the church appoints people who are good at looking after people and organizing people and, and deploying people in the right place at the right time, there are priests who look on and think, wow, the gospel has so changed you guys that you're doing this better than us. And so the, it, the, the practical transformation is evangelistic towards those with that kind of mindset. It makes me think about uh, our situation here. We, we as... Um, uh, as elders, uh, we'll need to reflect uh, more on this and pray into this and think through um, how, do we, uh, how do we put this into practice? This is the word, what happened then? What's the, uh, uh, what's the interpretation and the application of that for us today? There are lots of examples of what that could mean. Um, we're not going to do anything today uh, that will fix those things. Um, but just in terms of uh, a little bit of personal testimony... Um, I've come to realize over the last five years since we've been planted that as much as I thought I might be, I, I, I seemed to be okay at leading a team when I was working in the city, um, and I thought I was the, the social glue of the team. And I've discovered since I've been in ministry that I've been anything but that. I, kind of, I, just, I break people. <laughs> I, I'm not very good at working with people and deploying people. Um, I'm quite intense, and um, I see the end goal, and then um, I say, right, we're going to go there. Come on. And then not, nothing happens, and I don't really know why. I'm not very good at process, and, and I realize that God hasn't gifted me for organizing and deploying people. And so one of the things we've been praying into recently as a leadership team is, is that the Lord would raise up people who are gifted in those things in different ways. And um, we haven't sort of arrived yet, but I thought now would be an opportunity to get a couple of people who I think are differently gifted uh, from me to talk about their ideas, their uh, vision, their hopes um, for how we could do some of this. And the first person I wanted to ask to come up is Jim. Um, and Jim, I'm just going to hand over to you. Do you want me to ask you a question? Yeah, you ask me a question. Well, you don't have to. But, yeah. um, tell us a little bit about your vision for what happens when we meet, when we gather, and the build-up to that, what you call kind of hospitality ministry, uh, if you yeah. do call it that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I guess those of us from church backgrounds are very used to the idea of Sunday and serving on a Sunday and rotors and uh, that sort of practical aspect, and you're, you maybe have a role of welcoming. Um, so there's, there's various things that I, I, I've been praying about and reflecting on over, over the years, but I think particularly as we've been part of this church, um, and some of you will have noticed and some will be frustrated by uh, what we're trying to do a little bit here, which is um, all of those aspects of us being together as a church family as we meet, um, in a sense I'm calling hospitality. And so the Bible refers to us as a family, we, we know we're a family, we're also a body, but as a family, we'll be very used to being family at home, having our house, inviting people into our home, offering hospitality, whether that's food, whether that's opening the door. If somebody arrived at your home and you didn't open the door, that would be strange. Um, and sort of those aspects of things. But also just the conversation. Um, if you came to our house uh, and you didn't want us to speak because Debbie and I were just presenting all the time, that would be weird. Equally, if you came and we said nothing, and you just had to sort of talk amongst yourselves. If there's a few guests, that would be weird. And so this sort of, the use of this metaphor of, of a family is very much what we are as we gather. And so I wanted a word that wasn't welcome, um, that wasn't sort of just sort of serving on a rota. And, and so we're referring to that as hospitality. And it's all, I mean, everything we do is that. But there are aspects of what we can do here on a Sunday which... I think we can do differently to probably what people are used to. Now, in those days, there were Greek-speaking Christians and Hebrew-speaking Christians. I think in our day, there are rota-speaking Christians and non-rota-speaking Christians. And some of the non-rota-speaking Christians um, were feeling a little bit 
um, out of sorts. Now, there are aspects of what we do on a Sunday that absolutely need planning, need preparation. The individual people who are doing part of that service as a, as a family need to prepare. We can't let people not do something. And there are other aspects that we can do far more uh, sort of randomly, a little bit more um, in an improvised way. Uh, and I think how we do the practical aspects of a, of a Sunday as we gather can be very much more informal. And so some will know we've, we've sort of moved slightly from having rotors for all the as aspects of what we do on a Sunday morning uh, that are not mainly the youth work um, and, and the upfront teaching and, and hosting. Um, I think we need to go a little bit further. I think it's a bit of a culture shock for a lot of people. And so uh, I guess just for me, pray for wisdom um, in, in how, to, how to get that right. But it's just a little bit... It's a long answer to one question, isn't it? Um, it's just it's a, a little bit... Um, I don't know. I think it would be very strange in our own families if we only did something with each other, husband and wife, children, whatever it is, if we've already written down that we're going to do it on that day. That would be a little bit of a strange family. There are tasks as a family that we do need to do. We don't actually have to write it down. But there's so much of being a family that isn't that. And, of course, I think we're actually a great example of that through the week. I think um, informally through the week, we are looking out for each other. We're helping each other. We're doing practical things with each other. And I'm just trying to apply that into the areas of gathering on a Sunday, that we have got that, um, that advantage of freedom and informality. Thank you. Um, I get, actually, let me keep you there and, and invite Penny up. Where are you, Penny? We, we've got another mic, yep. haven't we? Look at that. Um, now, Penny, uh, I've been sort of chasing you around for a little while, <laughs> and every so often you, you pop up out of your work commitments, and now is one of those moments yeah. uh, where you, um, you've got a gap. Um, of seven weeks or something. Um, but um, <laughs> she, she has got her running shoes on. <laughs> um, but one of the things a lot of us have seen in you is that deploying people, delegating to people, helping people to know what they're doing and what's expected of them is something that you've had experience of in your secular work, um, and you're giving it a little go. Can you talk to that a bit and how this might relate to what we've been looking at today? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess a slight shift in the way I've been thinking about uh, church service and administrative stuff has come from Jim and the way that he's just described the difference between being a name on a list that rotates and um, being um, someone who has a heart to serve people. And uh, ironically, that did make me think, oh, yeah, I... I actually do like doing that, and I haven't, still haven't turned up and done it yet because I have kids and life is horrible. But um, <laughs> like, uh, uh, busy, I think the word. Busy, life is busy. Um, uh, but um, but it, 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 something switched inside me, and I um, because it made me think that there's a heart there for 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 serving others, and and that's we. I think we all have that. It's just that when you're on a rotor, you forget to engage that part of you sometimes. Um, because you're like, well, this is what I do, and I do it. Anyway, so that's, that was a change of heart for me, uh, which came about through Jim describing his initial idea back in the summer, I guess. Um, so that has affected the way I think about serving at church. Um, it's made me think that, you know, we, we all apply ourselves as we come, like, as we are, like... Um, and we don't have to be something different to who we are. So that's also helped me to see the way that Alex describes himself as not being good at uh, managing people. And I'm a bit like, well, you should just get on and do it. Like, this is what you're good at, right? Do it. Or not good at, you need to like, exercise that muscle and get on with it. Um, whereas now I'm starting to see that just in this, like in this passage, there are, we have, we have giftings and we have things that we're good at, things that we're not so good at. And oh boy, I'm sure God will help us to be really good at things that we're rubbish at now. But you know, let's play to our strengths. And amen, I have a strength of organizing. Some people call it being bossy. Um, Did you want to work on that? I'll be told I'm sitting here. 
going so badly. Um, <laughs> But when Alex uh, this week described how, um, and I've had this described to me before in the secular world, when, you know, uh, uh, particularly like a CEO of a company might have a really clear vision of why and what they do as a company, you know, this is really important, um, and they're passionate about it, and they have a vision, but the how is often, um, you find a lot in a lot of entrepreneurs, for example, you don't have a person who's a how kind of person and a what person they're normally there's normally like a separate kind of type of skills and so I think one way in which I can help um, with Alex and the lead and you know and the elders with their what is to be the how and to be the one that's saying um, well okay so what does that actually mean on the ground you know what, what does that mean for the people who are being told to turn up and do this thing every three weeks or whatever, and, you know, and aren't enjoying it or whatever. Um, and to look at the relationships behind that and the way that we work together uh, so that uh, it doesn't just feel like everyone's a cog in the machine, that uh, it's, it's a lot more than that, and that it's, it comes from a place of servant-heartedness. That was long as well, sorry. No, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, Jim, can you talk a little bit to the, the connection you've made between deploying people well in terms of hospitality and evangelistic yep. links? So, um, I think it's interesting in this passage in Act 6, um, this, this sort of confusion, as it were, that we have because of our sort of background of the words we use in, in this distinction between the word and, mm. and the sort of practical serving mm. and it's that ministry is the same ministry mm. and, 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 and for me, there's, 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 a, there's a huge aspect of, of of the hospitality of a Sunday being for ourselves. Um, we're, we're making ourselves comfortable, and, and we do that in our own lives as well. But of course there's hospitality, more literally speaking, to those that are coming in that are our, that are our guests. And, and, so, and so for me there's no distinction between sort of doing this for ourselves and doing this for somebody who may just come in, or, 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 or family of, of, of family as it were. Um, and, then it, and then it's not restricted to this, it sort of just spills out, it's, just a, it's a continuum. And so I think if you're confident, um, if you know uh, you're, you know, just speaking of a picture, our own house, so I'm slightly nervous because Debbie's invited everyone around, so, <laughs> and, and, and you haven't seen the dining room. Um, and so if you're confident that the dining room is clear and we can put everyone around, then you're going to go out and say, you know, come in. The lovely thing about Debbie is she just does it anyway. Uh, but, but, it, but if we're confident that, 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 that there is that hospitality here, then you can invite people in, aren't you? And, and so, so the boundaries are very, very blurred for me. But, but I think in a, in a previous sort of church experience, um, I think we were really, and it's very so encouraging in Acts 6, hearing, well, Acts generally, but hearing about this, this growth of the church. And one of the churches we were in was growing really well when I think there was a, there was a very good um, balance, and I think we see it in Act 6, between word ministry and other service ministry. Um, and I think things were not so good maybe when one was a little bit more dominant than the other, when we thought as a church that we needed good word ministers in each aspect of church life and maybe missed some of the good, speaking the truth through love, in hospitality ministry. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if we can get that balance right, it just seems to work. That's encouraging. Does anyone have any, any questions in the light of the talk or um, what has been said? Or if you want to tidy our body, you're welcome to come <laughs> <laughs> um, Sarah wanted to ask something. I don't know, this is a straight answer. Um, but uh, what I do know is different church families are very different. Um, uh, are different sort of cultural backgrounds. 
different sort of similar people attract similar sort of people, but we're praying for diversity. And, and so culturally, we, we inevitably will be something. And it will be a, a, a God-enabled, Holy Spirit-enabled and empowered single body family. What that is, I suspect, will keep changing. Um, uh, there, again, another church I was in, we, one of the, uh, a new guy came and was uh, heading up that church and he gave his first wedding and the bride turned up two hours late. But the church family were fine about that. Everyone was just chatting with each other for two hours while we waited for the bride. Um, that wouldn't be the same for another church. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but we need to be, we need to be family. And I think the more we are family, the more we'll work out what that is. Yeah, Dan, uh, Something I've noticed about working with lots of different teams, um, both uh, in my you know, faith journey and in my professional life, is that everyone always brings a different culture to the table. And actually, we all think that somehow we'll get to a point where we're all coexisting perfectly and that's that's not even a goal like that's not even a thing that's good to aim for um mm. because uh we are all called to be uh like relational people like that mm. we're not we're, we're very siloed in our culture like everyone is very individual mm. and actually what what hurts us most is for us to have to adapt and to sway and to to bend and bow to other people, uh, it's, really, it's really hard to do and it becomes harder and harder as our culture gets more crystallised into that way of looking at the world. And um, it's not meant to be easy, but it is meant to be like uh, ebb and flow and, and like we're not aiming for some perfect way of being, like we're all so different. Mm. And in times when I've seen that work really well has been times when not that we've been like totally tolerant of every single way of being, but like that we've seen that, that it's hard and that the conversations come about and that communication has to happen and that relationships are difficult and like that's actually when people are realizing that's happening and aware of it, that's often when the best uh, relationships are built between people that are different. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I think we should probably, um, uh, just looking at the time, uh, I don't know if, we, do we need to sing the last song? Yeah. Well, I think uh, we, we can. If, if, if parents need to go and get their kids, uh, there's enough of us here. I think this is a great one to, to end on, yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much, Jim and Penny. Let's give them a little round of applause, just because that seems to be a culturally appropriate thing to do. <laughs>